Moving ahead, I request uh, Dr. Malay Dave, senior psychiatrist from Mumbai, and uh, Dr. Mayur Muthe, young psychiatrist from Jalgaon, to come on stage and uh, chair the next session. The boundaries between neurology and psychiatry are blurred. We have to deal with symptoms intermingle, intermingling between neurology and psychiatry. One of such symptoms is related to the movements. And to address the same, we have a dynamic expert, Dr. Petras Wadia with us. I request Dr. Wadia to come on stage. And I request our chairpersons to introduce Dr. Wadia. Good morning, everyone. And uh, uh, I welcome all of you to this session on uh, women disorders, psychiatric aspects. Uh, women disorders, since the day I have been studying them, uh, I find them quite mysterious. Uh, somebody is ticking and somebody is not moving his or her limbs properly or moving in a not so conventional way. Uh, but this mystery always has a solution in the sense that most of the movement disorders have got a identifiable biological, neurological substrate. And in psychiatry, each and every disorder in one or the other way has got associated movements. Whether they be uh, something like neurological soft signs or tick-like movements, catatonia, all of these are movement disorders by themselves or associated with psychiatric disorders. Uh, very interesting topic and I hope Dr. Wadia is going to do good justice to this topic. Uh, my co-chair will introduce him and then we'll start. Good morning everybody. Uh, it is my honor and a pleasure to introduce Dr. Petras Wadia. He is consultant neurologist at Jaslok Hospital and Research Center, Mumbai. He is running the Movement Disorder Clinic. Uh, is one of the oldest in the country. He is founding member of Movement Disorder Society of India. He is founding member of the Neuromodulation Society. He is on the governing council of the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Society of India. And has multiple publications and awards to his credit. Uh, I think uh, we are lucky to have such illustrious speaker and I hand over the uh, mic to Dr. Wadia for further lecture. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and I thank Dr. Nagapurkar and Dr. Sonanis for inviting me here and uh, look forward to an interesting session of the, the, the movement disorder psychiatry overlap. So, so just to give you a brief for those who are uninitiated, movement disorder is a subspeciality of neurology that, that really has either hypokinetic movements, as you can see in this video, where the person is, uh, has reduction in movements or slow movements. And the commonest conditions here would be Parkinson's, PSP, corticobasal syndrome and of course not to forget drug-induced Parkinsonism that you probably see much more often than anything else. And you can even get hyperkinetic movements like in the other video. So you can get excessive movements in the form of tremors, chorea, dystonia, myoclonus. And, of course, this can also be drug-induced, as I will show in the next few slides. So, so basically, this is, this is the two broad categories of movement disorders, as we discussed. And what I'll be trying to cover in this short 45 minutes is uh, to give you an overview to drug-induced movement disorders, because I think that's the common platform that the, the, that the patients with, uh, uh, with uh, the, that, that psychiatrists would be seeing and to also look at uh, psychiatric manifestations of various movement disorders. In drug-induced movement disorders, I'll be largely covering neurolept-induced movement disorders, and I'll be also giving our own experience of drug-induced Parkinsonism, 
using DAT scans. And in the psychiatric manifestations, I have narrowed it down to a few common neurodegenerative disorders. I mean, I, they're, they're, there's, a, there's a huge overlap. I mean, I think there's a need for a neuropsychiatric clinic where the neurologists and psychiatrists sit together and see some difficult cases. But apart from that, I think we, we overlap a lot. So, so what are the movement disorders that are drug-induced? So you can have acute movement disorders, and most of you would have experienced oculogyric crisis occurring after giving a typical neuroleptic, or an acute dystonia or a jaw dystonia occurring within 24 hours of administration of a neuroleptic. That's acute dystonia. You can get acute akathisia as well. You, in the, as far as the, the other emergencies that can cause movement disorders would be neurolep malignant syndrome and serotonergic syndrome on excessive use of serotonergics or after exposure to neuroleptics. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to cover this. This is a separate topic in itself. I'll be focusing more on the chronic movement disorders, mainly tardive dyskinesia, dystonia, akathisia. So, so what are tardive syndromes? Tardive syndromes occur after exposure to the drug and they can occur even one month after the drug has been withdrawn and can occur right up to six months after drug withdrawal. The classic ones are the tardive dyskinesia, the, the rhythmic stereotypical orolingual dyskinesias. We also have tardive dystonia, akathisia with the feeling of restlessness, which I think all of you are very well versed with. And you can get Parkinsonism and rarely some other syndromes. And this is a classic tardive dyskinesia. And you can see he has orolingual dyskinesias. Uh, soundless. So, so this is classic, sorry, there's another video. And this is study of dyskinesias where there's trunk involvement. And you can see trunk dyskinesias. She also had mild orolingual dyskinesias. Both of these occurred after exposure to neuroleptic agents. So tardive dyskinesias are typically coriform atheroid movements. They last for several weeks. You can common areas involved are the tongue, lower face, jaw, and extremities. You can also have pharyngeal, diaphragmatic, and tongue, tongue, trunk involvement. And usually, the duration of exposure is usually at least several months. And it can be much lesser in the elderly. The elderly are more prone to develop tardive dyskinesias. And that's why, in the elderly, I think we should be more careful in using more atypical agents rather than typical agents. And often, by definition, they persist one month after withdrawal to call it tardive. Now, not everything that has mouth movements are dyskinesias. And this is one example. This is a person with orolingual dyskinesias, but it's not due to exposure to a drug. And this gentleman actually had liver cirrhosis. And these movements are secondary to a chronic acquired hepatolenticular degeneration. So, so not every mouth movement is tardive dyskinesias, and that's, that's where the challenge lies. And luckily for us, with better control of the liver cirrhosis, his mouth movements did improve substantially. But just to highlight that not everything that has mouth movements are tardive. Another one, this is actually a very much more commoner condition in the elderly. Uh, can I get a little sound? Avaz? What is the so, so this is a gentleman who actually had a lot of dental issues, so they removed all the teeth. Someone was not happy with the denture that he got, so he's edentulous. And this is actually edentulous dyskinesias. So this is another condition that can cause orolingual dyskinesias. And this is what happened after his teeth were footed. Sound, sound, sound. और जो बत्ती सी लगाने के बाद तुरंत बाद राहत मालूम पड़ गया या टाइम लगा? So he says, as soon as the dentures were put, I was sorted out. So, so just ill-fitting dentures can cause an orolingual dyskinesia. So, so just to highlight that not everything that has mouth movements is tardive, but you so you have a, a broad differential diagnosis. But I think the history is the key. If you have a history of exposure to a neuroleptic, the commonest cause would be tardive dyskinesias. 
This is a lady who's been exposed to neuroleptic agents and, and what is she experiencing? She has some trunk dyskinesias, but she also has a, a trunk going backwards, a neck, neck posturing, she has a turning to the right, a retrocollis of the neck. So she has cervical as well as trunk dystonia as well as dyskinesia and this is typical when you have a retrocollis and a backward trunk deviation, this is typical neurolept induced pattern. So she was exposed to neuroleptic drugs and this is a typical pattern and this is tardive dystonia. And this is another gentleman with tardive dystonia and this is actually a very sad story. He was a petrol pump attendant and he developed a retrocollis so he could even see where he was filling the, putting the nozzle to fill it's petrol right, in the vehicles. So, so he had a, a retrocollis main pattern of dystonia. This is in fact the most common tardive pattern for dystonia. And luckily, he did respond to botulinum ah, toxin. So his, his neck movements did improve after so, botulinum toxin. This is another gentleman who was actually not exposed to neuroleptics but to cinarazine. And he was taking cinarazine for a long time for vertigo. And he came with the complaints that he's just not able to sit in one place. Very restless. He also had some tardy, some dyskinesias, but very restless, just, just wouldn't sit in one place. This is akathisia, and this is akathisia secondary to cinnamon, of course it can occur secondary to neuroleptics, which you'll have all seen. So this is akathisia and dyskinesias, and this is a lip tremor, which can be seen as a withdrawal emergence syndrome, when dopamine receptor blood, sometimes anticholinergics are not prescribed for some reason along with it, you can get a quivering lip tremor which is known as rabbit syndrome. So just have a look at the lips and you can see a little quivering lip tremor and this is called as rabbit syndrome and this is, this is now, usually associated with typical dopamine with receptor blocking drugs when we haven't used an anticholinergic. And it's only them Sound, and knowing sounds. what your problems have been. So how do we diagnose a drug-induced or neurolept-induced movement disorder? I think you have to recognize the abnormal movement, whether it's hypokinetic or hyperkinetic, whether it's dystonia, dyskinesia, or Parkinsonism. Identify the temporal relationship with the drug, and this is where a careful drug history is important, whether it's neuroleptic or cinarazine, or it's the new, new problem agent on the block, levosulpride for us. And exposure to the agent should be within the last three months. And there are certain patterns, as I described, the retrocollis, the orolingual dyskinesias, and the akathisias, which t generally point to a drug-induced movement disorder. And if you see two patterns, you see an akathisia and you see dyskinesia, you're more likely dealing with a neuroleptic movement disorder. And this is a paper that really looked at whether neuroleptic movement disorders are less if you use typical versus atypical neuroleptic agents. And uh, this was done in Canada, where they, where they did in, in, in a population in a nursing home which had a lot of dementia. And there was really no difference in the demographic population between the two groups. And when they look at the incidence of uh, tardive dyskinesias or dystonia or, or drug-induced movement disorders, there was absolutely no difference between the groups. But the problem was that this study was done way back when they were using largely risperidone olanzapine as their atypical agents, and only 2% were really on quetiapine. So, so probably even some the atypical agents have to be chosen more carefully and I think we have to use the truly atypical agents like quetiapine or clozapine. And believe me, even aripeprazole is not, not safe and neither is loracidone. They all can cause tardy movement disorders or Parkinsonism. So really the truly atypical agents are quetiapine and clozapine. And of course, if I tell my psychiatric colleagues sometimes that they say uh, they're not going to control most of the psychosis, which I do agree. So it's not, it's not easy. I mean, the choices are not easy. So we have to explain, I mean, and this is what I explain to the patients, that look, you were on an agent because there was no choice at that time. And you had to be put on this agent, and this is a side effect that sometimes happens. So, so you really can't blame the psychiatrist for using an, a, an agent because this was required at that time. The patient was probably very aggressive, behaviorally difficult. But I think the only way to prevent is to be very judicious about use of dopamine receptor blocking. And initially, if you have to use it for a very severe psychosis episode or schizophrenia, Whenever you get the opportunity or the patient is better to shift to a really, truly typical agent, it's not that they're all great. Quetiapine can cause weight gain and can cause a lot of other issues. 
but try for a truly atypical agent like clozapine or quetiapine. But when we're using clozapine, we have to monitor the blood counts. Primamanserine is an option in Parkinson's hallucinations because it's approved, but it's a mainly serotonergic agent, so it really doesn't really help in psychosis. Um, we have to be careful at the extremes of agents because these are the ones who are really, really at higher risk of developing tardive dyskinesia, dystonia. And I think we have to work together in treating tardive dystonia, dyskinesia, and we have to use the right language. When a patient comes to a neurologist, you can't tell him, oh, this is your psychiatric drugs. No, the psychiatric drugs were required but this is an unfortunate side effect which is known to occur with these drugs. And there's no choice. You have to live with it. So I think management of the drug-induced movement disorders involves stopping the drugs and preferably, I mean, it cannot be stopped. It has to be in discussion with the psychiatrist, understanding how the behavioral symptoms are controlled, and you have to go slow. And the neurologist cannot be in the driving seat. It's the psychiatrist who's in the driving seat. You can only coax the psychiatrists that get off the drugs, get off the drugs, go, get off as fast as you can. But it's not the neurologist in the driving seat, and I keep telling my patients very, the same thing. Because unless the behavioral symptoms are controlled, you cannot control tardive dyskinesia, dyskinesia. And for symptom control, especially for the oral lingual dyskinesia, tetrabenzene is a superb drug. In certain situations where you're getting Parkinsonism with the tetrabenzene, amantadine is an option. Propranolol sometimes has been used. If you have a focal dystonia, like I showed for the neck dystonia, you can use bottle and toxin. In very severe cases, you have to use DBS. This is one of my favorite cases. It's, it has a 39-year-old gentleman who actually had alcoholism and was treated by a psychiatrist, sorry, and was treated by a psychiatrist for alcoholism with typical neuroleptics. And he came to me like this, just couldn't sit in the chair, absolutely restless, severe akathisias, along with that had some dystonia, dyskinesia, but really restless. I mean, taking a history from him was so difficult. I mean, he just wouldn't sit in one place. And we're not used to the patients pacing around our room when they're giving history. Okay. So, so in fact, I, I, had, I, I told him at that point, look, he was already off the neuroleptics. We had, he was on tetrabenazine, he was, everything had been tried, and I said, look, I, I think you're headed for DBS. I don't know how we're going to control your symptoms, but I said, let's give a shot, let's give clozapine. And he saw me one month later, and I was, I was really surprised. So, so don't forget clozapine. It's one of the few agents that controls the psychiatric symptoms as well as the movement disorders. And the incidence of agranulocytosis is extremely low, but not so low to the point that you become absolutely complacent and don't monitor WBC counts. You have to look at the liver function test, you have to monitor QTC intervals, you have to do WBC counts. But believe me, I think it's underutilized. And in, in safe hands, clozapine is a Chala. superb agent. Normal salata. And we tend to use a lot of clozapine. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit. This is a lady who came with subacute Parkinsonism. And she really was referred to me for deep brain stimulation surgery because she was not responding to anything. Uh, can you reduce the volume, please? Volume so she's come with slowness of movements, very short history, and, and very high, fairly high UPDRS, very akathetic. She was again restless, totally restless in the, in the outpatient clinic. And I, then I went back, show me all the drugs you're taking, show me all the drugs. And it transpired that she had a lot of GI symptoms and she was put on levosulpride, which is the brother of amisulpride, which you're all very, very familiar with and it has the same side effect profile. And this is levosulpride-induced Parkinsonism. Luckily for her, her dopamine scan was normal, and in pure drug-induced Parkinson's disease, Parkinsonism, you'll get a normal dopamine scan, indicating that there is no dopamine transporter problems. And we stopped her symptoms. She was having cognitive problems. She was not able to sleep. She was apathetic, and she, she had a, a huge recovery. UPDR score dropping from 22 to 3.5. So this is levosulpride-induced Parkinsonism, but I have seen almost similar patterns with amisulpride. 
So amisulpride is absolutely contraindicated when there is anything close to Parkinsonism. Okay. And I've seen, I, and I've, I've had situations where the patient has been put on amisulpride and all that you do is withdraw the amisulpride and the patient is much better. So amisulpride is not, not a nice drug when it comes to Parkinsonism. So the drugs that cause Parkinsonism, neuroleptics, levosulpride, amisulpride, and of course a whole lot. Don't forget valproate, which you use for bipolar disease. But all the valproate is milder, but it can definitely cause Parkinsonism. So how do you suspect drug-induced Parkinsonism? It's, it's a fairly subacute, it's far more rapid than a normal Parkinson disease. Usually will come with bilateral symmetric symptoms. You have a time lock to the medicine. You know you started this medicine and then you started becoming slow. If you get concurrent oral buccolingual dyskinesias or akathisias, that helps. The risk factors are if you're elderly, if you've had exposure to drugs or preclinical Parkinsonism, then, then you're higher propensity to develop this disease. We looked at our data of patients who've had new onset Parkinsonism exposed to any drug that is known to cause Parkinsonism, and all of them have had dopamine scans. And we had 21 patients, eight female, 13 male, and the average age was 64, and average duration of offending drug was about 18 months. Although with levosulpride, the average duration was only five months, much shorter, indicating it's far more worse than the neuroleptics. And we looked at them into two groups, depending on whether their dopamine scans were normal or abnormal. This is the unified Parkinson disease rating scale, which is a Parkinson scale, and we plotted the Parkinson scale from baseline, one month, one year. And the long-term follow-up in most of the cases indicated that most of them recovered, indicating that they were pure drug-induced Parkinson's disease. On the other hand, 50% of them had abnormal DAT scans, indicating that they probably were destined to get Parkinson's or they had subclinical Parkinsonism, which was not detected before they were exposed to any of these agents. And they didn't seem to have a very good improvement. And their UPDRSs, although they fell initially, because of the withdrawal of the offending agent, they didn't really improve in the long term, and most of them were actually on levodopa, carbidopa subsequently. So just to highlight that almost 50% of those who get, get drug-induced Parkinsonism actually have abnormal DAT scans. So probably it's not just the drug, it's also your own body, which you're, you're probably prone to get Parkinsonism in 50% of the cases and you actually get subclinical Parkinson's disease. And, and I'm sure you'll have all seen many of these patients where who've received a neuroleptic agent and the agent has been blamed, but the patient has never recovered in the last 15, 20 years subsequently. And they actually have Parkinson's disease and they improved with levodopa, carbidopa, or any of the dopaminergic drugs. But of course, they have to be used very carefully, especially if, this, if it's a primary psychosis, because levodopa, carbidopa, and the dopaminergic agents can cause severe worsening of hallucinations and psychosis. And just to highlight that actually neuroleptics took about 30 months before they got Parkinsonism, while the levosulpride was just five months, indicating that amisulpride and levosulpride are far more dangerous than the neuroleptics in causing drug-induced Parkinsonism. Even valproate is pretty slow, 29 months. And just as expected, some had orolingual dyskinesia, some had akathisias with the levosulpride group. So levosulpride is pretty much almost behaves like the other neuroleptic agents. So, so patients with normal dopaminergic uptake are more likely to have complete short-term and long-term remission, and these are the real, pure, drug-induced Parkinsonism. Patients who have dopaminergic deficits on DAT scans tend to have an incomplete recovery and often require long-term dopaminergic agents, and these people probably had subclinical Parkinson's disease prior to, prior to the exposure of the drugs. And I think just to highlight that levosulpride and amisulpride are actually troublesome agents, and I'm, I've gone around telling all the family doctors and gastroenterologists, please be careful when you prescribe them. So I'm going to slightly change gears. We're still at drug-induced movement disorder. This is a 62-year-old gentleman who couldn't sleep for the last six months, had tingling pain, vibration in the feet at night, but otherwise, the rest of the day was perfect. He was used to applying balm in the feet before he slept. Often, he used to pace the room at night when he couldn't sleep, and when he paced the room, his tingling sensations went away. This is restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome is an uncomfortable sensation in the legs when you're lying in bed, but the moment you get up and walk, you're fine. Then he suffered some business stress. There were some business losses, and rightly, he went and met an anti -psychiatri a psychiatrist, and he was put on an antidepressant prescription. 
The next day, he didn't sleep. I had a, an emergency call from his cardiologist. You have to take him in today. Whether you're full or not, I don't care. You have to see him. This guy is going crazy. And these are the drugs that were prescribed. Escitalopram, amitriptyline, flupenthixol, melitrosin. Now, three serotonergic agents. All SSRIs and tricyclics can acutely worsen restless leg syndrome. So, I think the, the message here was, while we are at drug-induced movement disorders, don't forget serotonergic agents worsening restless leg syndrome. And believe me, you gave the drug to help his depression, but if he couldn't sleep, he's not going to get better anyway. So you have to be aware that SSRIs and tricyclics can really, really worsen restless leg syndrome. And the only depressants that, antidepressants that can be used in restless leg syndrome are bupropion, duloxetine, buspirone, because they don't tend to worsen restless leg syndrome. So I'll conclude drug-induced movement disorder section here, but that's a group of reversible movement disorders. Early recognition is the key. Ensure a proper drug history is taken and all drugs consumed are seen, and prevention is better than cure, as we discussed. So we move to the psychiatric manifestations of various movement disorders. I'm going to go through them a little briefly. Uh, so the neuropsychiatric manifestations are the commonest one being Parkinson's disease. You can get anxiety, depression, predating Parkinson's by several years. Dementia is seen in about 30% of Parkinson's disease. They can come with frank hallucinations, psychosis, because of the Parkinson's disease. And, and impulse control disorders are another agent where there's another condition where there's often psychiatrist neurologist overlap. Anxiety is seen as about 40%. We can get panic attacks as well. They frequently coexist with depression. And I think that the treatment choices are same as in the general population. Depression is seen in about 20 to 40 percent of the patients, often under-recognized and under-treated. And the difficulty is that the symptoms of Parkinson's often overlap with depression. And many times the patients actually diagnose depression prior to the diagnosis of Parkinson's because we know that depression can predate Parkinson's disease. And subsequently then the patients start showing the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So you always have to be careful, even as a psychiatrist, even whether you're doing telepsychiatry, to look for the gait and see whether the patient has actually slowed down is there a tremor? Is there stiffness, slowness? So, it's, so I think even with telepsychiatric, they probably used to see the patient once in a year at least. So, so presentations of depression in PD can be, uh, you can have actually anxiety, pessimism, and many of the classic situations where I've diagnosed depression in Parkinson's is where the patient's Parkinson's symptoms, signs are absolutely not visible. And the Parkinson's symptoms are well controlled, but the patient says, Doctor, I'm not well at all. I'm so tired. I can't move. I can't do this. That's when you realize that probably there's underlying depression. So it's, it's actually very difficult to pick up depression in a person with Parkinson's disease because there's a lot of overlap of symptomatology. And about almost 20 to 25 percent of all Parkinson patients require one or another antidepressant. So depression can hit in the preclinical stage even before Parkinson's disease. You can get it in the early stage when there is absolutely no acceptance of the disease. They're not willing to accept, I cannot get Parkinson's, why me? And I think all, all patients go through this for any disease. Then patients can be in a situation where their Parkinson's symptoms are controlled, but they are unwell because they're depressed. And then there's, there's also this whole thing about hiding the disease from the rest of society, which actually makes you even worse off than, than you actually started out. I haven't to tell my employer, nobody should know, my neighbor shouldn't know, and you're trying to hide your tremor. So I think that makes, that makes your disease acceptance even more difficult and really puts you into depression. And then later on, it can come as a non-motor wearing off. So as soon as your dopaminergic effect has gone away for the medicines, then you become anxious, depressed, and, and it becomes actually very difficult. So really there, the treatment is control the wearing off better. In advanced diseases, it becomes a frustration that you're dependent on somebody for your daily needs, and that really pushes you into depression. And depression can even occur post deep brain stimulation because you've reduced the dopaminergic medicines by about 50 to 70 percent. And dopaminergic drugs itself improve depression. So then you can get post DBS depression. They can be sometimes really, really difficult to handle. And there have been suicides reported post DBS. So the management of depression is initially optimizing the dopaminergic treatment. And we know that the dopamine agonists itself have antidepressant properties. And Almost all the antidepressant classes can be used, SSRIs, SNRIs, TCAs, of course not imisulpride. So, so cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease has been reported quite often, and if you look at a Sydney multi-center study with 
15 year follow up, 48% had dementia, 36% had MCI. So it's, it's huge number of patients who are going to eventually get cognitive impairment. And they, even before cognitive impairment, they can have bradyphrenia, impaired executive function, poor attention and concentration, even visuospatial defects. So if in a normal neuropsych testing of a person who has no other symptoms, you're probably going to pick up some of this anyway. But because we do neuropsych testing for all patients prior to DBS, so you're going to pick them up. That doesn't mean that the patient is ineligible for DBS because almost every Parkinson patient is going to have some amount of executive dysfunction and some visuospatial defects. And when we looked at the screening tool for, for detecting dementia, we compared the Montreal Cognitive Assessment versus the MMSE. The MOCA, because of the number of frontal executive functions that are tested compared to the MMSE, far scores better in diagnosing, in, assess, in picking up deficits in Parkinson's disease than the MMSE. The MMSE is a horrible tool because it doesn't pick up frontal dysfunction at all. So, so if you look at how you're going to assess them, we talked about it. The treatment really is you have evidence to, to use donopezil or rivastigmine. Both of them are equally efficacious. You also have to taper anticholinergics if the patient is on anticholinergics. Anticholinergics worsen cognitive impairment. Always look for B12, thyroid, and other factors that are causing cognitive impairment. And always rule out delirium because they often have underlying urinary tract infection or severe constipation, which can also worsen their cognitive factors. This is a 67-year-old gentleman with Parkinson's since nine years, came with motor fluctuations, and was admitted in the emergency with active visual hallucinations. He had no insight. He was aggressive. The relatives just couldn't handle him. And this is his prescription, along with levodopa, carbidopa, he's on pramipexol, amantadine, rasagiline. Now, all these agents can worsen hallucinations. So what we did was we stopped the amantadine, rasagiline, gradually tapered off the agonist, we, we, we had to add donopezil and quetiapine at that stage. Hallucinations eventually stopped. So hallucinations and psychosis are common in Parkinson's disease, and they can, they can really disrupt the life completely. And the, the thing to, they're, they're about, in untreated Parkinson's, less than 10%, but in treated Parkinson's, 15 to 40%. That's huge. And unlike schizophrenia and psychosis, it's visual hallucinations, not auditory hallucinations. And in mild cases, the insight is preserved, but in the, in the other cases, there is no insight. They're there. They're, they're, they're there. They, they think it's there. It's real. They can, they can become paranoid, delusional. They can have early... So if there are a lot of early psychosis, you have to suspect dementia Lewy body. But otherwise, hallucinations are par for cause as far as Parkinson's disease. The, the message is first treat any infection, electrolyte imbalance, and pain. Manage your constipation. Most of the times, they are impacted bowels. And you treat the constipation, and 90% of your problems settle down there itself. And you have to taper those drugs, which can worsen psychosis. First, anticholinergic. Second, dopamine agonist. Third, amantadine. Fourth, MAO-B inhibitors. So you're really left with only levodopa, carbidopa that you can use safely in this situation. And as far as neuroleptics are concerned, we usually use quetiapine, although the evidence is much poorer for quetiapine as compared to clozapine. But simply because clozapine requires monitoring and is far more difficult to use. There is a lot of evidence for using of primavanserine. Unfortunately, we don't have primavanserine in India, but we're looking forward to getting it because that can reduce hallucinations. And there is definitely a role for adding cholinesterase inhibitors because that also reduces the visual hallucinations, even if there's no real, clear cognitive impairment. And in many times, the cause of the hallucinations is probably none of the above, but it is some anxiety or depression. And you have to sometimes address these issues. And, and very often, you have to be a teamwork with the psychiatrist to pick up this anxiety and depression issues. So it's, it is a teamwork. We're switching gears a little. 42-year-old gentleman, a diamond jeweler from Hong Kong, Excellent control of Parkinson's disease, high dose of dopamine agonist. This is the highest dose of dopamine roll, which is now approved. Uh, was sleeping at 2 a.m., woke up only at, woke up at 5 a.m. He said, I don't need the sleep. And in the middle of the night when he was awake, he used to binge on food, open the refrigerator, finish a full tub of ice cream in the night. Then he would spend his whole night doing carpentry. Not a single item of carpentry actually ever completed. His family got really irritated because he used to go on Amazon, buy carpentry equipment. <coughs> And he was doing carpentry. God knows what he made. He, nothing was there. The wife was almost at the brink saying, I am leaving him. I'm going living separately. I can't handle it. 
And what was he experiencing? He was experiencing funding. The carpentry was funding. It's repetitive, nonsensical behavior which doesn't give any output. Apart from that, he had compulsive shopping, he had binge eating, he had become 95 kilos. So this is impulse control disorders. Impulse control disorders include compulsive behaviors like gambling, shopping, eating, hypersexuality. You can get funding and you can get even a dopamine dysregulation syndrome. We had to cut the rope and roll out completely, put him on levodopa. The he started freezing as far as his gait is concerned. Compulsive carpentry stopped. He started sleeping for at least six hours a day instead of three. His binge eating still occurred. He, he, weighed, he lost some five kilos of weight or something like that, not much. Eventually required deep brain stimulation because his Parkinson control absolutely could not be achieved with levodopa alone. And finally landed up with a deep brain stimulation. He is doing well now. So impulse control disorders are pleasurable behaviors performed repetitively, excessively, and compulsively. And they really can cause absolute havoc in the life of patients. You can get gambling behaviors, shopping behaviors, eating behaviors. They can become really hypersexual. And hypersexuality can be a real problem in looking after some of the senior citizens. Especially if there's female staff at home and the patient is a male, it can be a nightmare. So funding is a word described really from the Swedish literature. It's, it's analogous to motor stereotypies. It was first described by psychostimulant addicts. It's excessive hobbyism, which is prolonged, disabled, and highly stereotyped or ritualistic behaviors. The patient may completely neglect their physiological needs, that they need to eat or anything. And if you actually even disturb them during that process, they can become violent, angry. I don't want to eat. I told you, I'm, I'm busy with carpentry. But you've not achieved anything. So you can have collecting and hoarding items, you can have cleaning. I had a gentleman who spent his whole day just filing his shares. And this went on for one month. He was only filing that same share file again and again and again. It was a repetitive behavior. So, so you can have a seamstress which only sorts buttons the whole for the next one month. And funding can occur in two situations. One is dopamine agonist related, which is at least treatable. But funding can occur when you have dementia and Parkinson's. And they are impossible to treat. You, the family has to just come to terms with it. So I had one person, one Parkinson patient, a doctor who spent his whole day cutting paper. So his, even for the doctor's appointments, his wife would come with a bag of radhi paper and a scissors and say, cut. Because that, that was the only way she could handle him. So, so some of the dementia with funding, you just can't deal with. Another, another example, 39-year-old gentleman with Parkinson's for 10 years, had a frontal lobe glioma excised on dopaminergic drugs since 2000. Prior to 2008, started self-medicating. He started taking excessive dopaminergic drugs, developed dyskinesias, hallucinations. He was hypersexual. Hypersexual to the point that he would buy pornography videos, was seeing it even in front of his children who were minors at that point. And it was, it was absolute havoc. He developed mania. He had to be restrained, sedated, brought to the hospital. So he had dopamine dysregulation syndrome because of excessive consumption of levodopa, carbidopa, and dopamine agonist. He had hypersexuality, mania. And this is also part of dopamine dysregulation syndrome. Again, the same impulse control family. Compulsive use of dopaminergic medications well beyond the need that is required. And they can get aggressive, impulsive. They can be literally on a high and an on phase. And really, the only way is to reduce the medicines. And it was tough because we had to take away the option of him ever medicating himself. And even then, he would steal money from the driver to buy a packet of levodopa, carbidopa, just so that he could get himself on. And believe me, very, very difficult. And to make things worse, he had a frontal lobe glioma, so he was already having frontal lobe dysfunction. We even thought of doing deep brain stimulation to control his Parkinson's better, but then the glioma recurred, so there was no question. There was no, there was no meaningful quality of life that was achievable by doing deep brain stimulation. Finally, he succumbed to his brain tumor. So impulse control disorders can be seen in 13.6% of Parkinson's patients, not a small number. And luckily for us, we don't have good access to casinos, so we are safe from the gambling to a little extent. Although I've had a patient lost 20 lakhs in matka, believe me, even after telling him everything. Compulsive sexual behavior, buying, binge eating can all be seen. And they are, they are about 17% if you are on dopamine agonist versus 6.9% if you are not. And there's really no difference whether you're on primipex hole or rope and roll. So moving on, this is Huntington's disease where the person had chorea. 
and had a family history of Korea. And Korea, we know, apart from the motor symptoms, where you can get Korea, Parkinson's, dystonia, myoclonus, you can also get personality issues, affective disorder, obsessive compulsive issues, and psychosis. Cognitive impairment can also be seen. And really, you have to treat all, all parameters together. It cannot be just treating only one aspect. We move on to ticks. Ticks are rapid, brief, purposeless movements and involving multiple muscle groups. And you can get motor, vocal, phonic, and you can see he has a neck tick here in the video. And they can be very disturbing, like this one. This one has a vocal tick. Voice, please. Sound. Sound. <laughs> Sorry, getting through. Um. So he has a sniffling tick, and the whole time he did this, very disabling. If you have such a disabling tick, it's really difficult to function. So, so you can have simple ticks, motor ticks, complex ticks, verbal ticks. You can even get coprolalia in the ticks. This is a boy with a, a fifth standard student who had ticks, but he had ticks when he was relaxed, playing cricket, listening to music. But, but really there was other issues. There were a lot of obsessive compulsive features and there was a lot of pressure from the parents trying to push him to do multiple things. And those were the issues which we actually had to deal with more than that ticks. The ticks we actually said we don't do anything about them. But really we had to, we had to counsel the parents. And most of the times it's the parents who need treatment rather than the child with Tourette's syndrome. So these are some of his ticks that he has. So Tourette's syndrome is multiple motor plus one phonic tick. There has to be a vocal tick. There has to be, the ticks have to change over time. You have to have a duration of more than one year, onset less than 21, and there has to be no other reason to explain the, the symptoms. Psychiatric associations, 64% have personality disorders. They can have borderline personality depressive, obsessive compulsive, paranoid or passive aggressive personalities. Higher incidence of mood disorders. ADHD is very common. I have a Tourette's syndrome who just cannot hang on to his job. He's changed at least 20 jobs in five years. They, because they have a personality. They're not paying me enough, I'm much better. So it's, it's, it's pretty tough to deal with them. You have to have joint management with the psychiatrist for a large number of them. And a lot of the management is non-pharmacological, educational, behavioral therapy. Pharmacological, if it's really severe or interfering with your schoolwork. There is a role for botulinum toxin for focal tics. There's a lot of role for behavioral therapies. Deep brain stimulation is done in absolutely severe disabling tics. And you have to control the ADHD and the OCD, and they have to be all managed together. The first line agents which I generally use is clonidine, but it's a very mild agent. If it's, if it's more than that, you typically have to move to an atypical agent, and really here, quetiapine doesn't work. Neither does clozapine. You have to use risperidone or olanzapine to control the tics. You can also use classical agents, but I reserve them for really, really disabling ticks only. There is some role for even using pramipexol in ticks, and although it's, one is a dopamine antagonist and the other is dopamine agonist, there is, there is evidence to show that pramipexol also works for ticks, and I have used that when we are afraid of the dopaminergic receptor blocking side effects of the neuroleptics. And this is a person who had really disabling ticks. He was a graphic designer, and he had a collection of 50 computer mice which he had broken because he would have a hand tick and the mouse would break. Look at his ticks. These are his ticks. I mean, he could not work. He had to just give up work. Voice, please. And these are his ticks in the bed. He would go on and bang his head in the tick. So these are, these are really intractable Tourette's. So we finally subjected him to deep brain stimulation surgery, which we'll see in a bit. Yeah, so, so Tourette's cannot be, I mean the majority is easy to handle, but the minority can really, really make your life difficult. Hello, my name is Jitendra. I have two months ago my operation. Ko, and so he was uh, lucky he could control his tics. All his symptoms are in control. Mein hai. और uh, मैं अभी पहले से बहुत ज्यादा बेटर कंफर्टेबल फील कर रहा हूं और uh, मैं फ्यूचर के बाद सो ही डिड वेरी वेल अनफॉर्चूनेटली डेवलप्ड अ इंफेक्शन ऑफ द लीड सो वी फाइनली हैड टू स्टिमुलेट थ्रू द लीड 
and create a lesion. So he has had landed up with bilateral pallidotomy through the DBS electrode, but he is still doing well. So there are other behavioral therapies for Tourette syndrome, which I think you all are probably much better off than I do in understanding what it does. There have even looked at transcranial magnetic stimulation for Tourette's where the initial studies have been negative. So, so really tick disorders have a wide spectrum, not all requiring treatment, and management is comprehensive. I'm going to skip the next bit and just go to the concluding slides. Yeah, so, so I'll conclude by saying, movement disorders are heterogeneous. We have to recognize the phenomenology first, whether it's chorea, dystonia, or Parkinsonism. Do not miss treatable causes which can present with psychiatric symptoms, especially Wilson's disease. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't cover Wilson's disease. But in Wilson's disease, what is important is that the psychiatric symptoms of Wilson's disease typically doesn't come initially. Initially, the patient is in an arcanetic rigid state. And when the patient starts improving, that's when you see the real psychosis, aggression, and behavioral challenges. And they are, they are really difficult to behave. They can become hypersexual, and, and the parents can go through hell. But luckily, as the decoppering occurs, that's just a phase that, that you have to deal with for a one or two years at the most, and then they become all right. So you have to just dig your heels in and support them. Drug-induced movement disorders, as we said, can be challenging. Recognize the patterns. And I think the management is multidisciplinary. And I think I'm almost married to all the psychiatrists I work to, because we have to work together and we have to be all on the same page. And you have to have a very good rapport with the psychiatrist and the psychologist when you're dealing with some of these very, very difficult cases. Thank you very much. Yeah. Questions? Uh, just before you ask question, there is one announcement. Uh, we are running short of time, so uh, as a chairperson, we are going to allow only one question. If you have any other questions, you can talk to Dr. Wadia over a cup of tea later. And thank you, Dr. Wadia, for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Myself, Dr. Vimal Somaya from Rajkot. Sir, I would like to know that uh, triaxifenidyl as a treatment of tardive dyskinesia, or should we discontinue triaxifenidyl in uh, treatment of tardive dyskinesia? So, in what dosage? So, triaxifenidyl really helps dystonia. It doesn't help tardive dyskinesias at all. So, triaxifenidyl you all can use as a preventive for drug-induced movement disorders, but it doesn't prevent tardive dyskinesias. So, really, really what you need to do is to, to treat uh, tardive dyskinesias by tetrabenazine or amantadine if you can't use tetrabenazine. But be careful, tetrabenazine causes depression. So, you have to be, you have to be prepared for that. Dr. Bhave? Uh, clinically yes, and cross-sectionally, is there any way to differentiate Parkinson's disease with her drug induced Parkinsonism cross-sectionally? So, uh, clinically very difficult. There is absolutely no difference between the two patients' group. If you don't have access to dopamine scans, which most people don't because they are available only in few metros in India, the, the option is to actually stop the agent and score their Parkinson's, their UPDR scale, Af before you stop it and after you stop it within a month. And if there's a rapid decline, probably you're dealing with pure drug-induced. But if not, you have to keep your eyes and ears open that this may be actually underlying Parkinson's disease. But other than that, I think the DAT scan is probably the most useful thing that you can do here. Right. Um, because sometime back I had heard that uh, it's about laterality, like Parkinson's disease, they are... Uh more prominent on one side, whereas drug-induced are True, but we really, we really didn't find that in the study. There was enough of asymmetric Parkinsonism in the drug-induced group. Uh, okay, last question. Sir, I'm Dr. Lakadawala from Mumbai. Yes, sir. Uh, regarding Dr. Bhave's thing, I'm just putting it. Uh, three years back, I develop uh, tremors on the left side. It continued for three months, and then I consulted a neurologist, and he said uh, that, look, you are aging, it is Parkinsonism. And then I went for, I insisted that I want to undergo dopamine scan, which came normal. Then we went into details whether any specific drug I was taking. Of course, I have a migraine, 
and for a reasonable period, I was taking flunarazine. But flunarazine is a, a known agent to cause drug-induced Parkinsonism. So, sir, uh, thank you so much. I am free. I am reasonably free. Maybe after a couple of years, I may again develop something. I'll no, I hope you don't, because <laughs> because the drug-induced Parkinsonism with normal DAT scans are cured. <laughs> CPK levels have no role, sir. No role. They are, they are only useful in neurolep malignant syndrome, but there is no role in tardy dyskinesia dystonia at all. So, writer's cramp is a form of dystonia, and I haven't covered that for the want of time, but that's a separate disease. It's, it's a disease that has nothing to do with any drug or anything. There are, there are genes that can drive it, and the treatment of choice is drugs or Botox or botulinum toxin, which can be given at that point. So rheumatic chorea, first of all, we're seeing less and less and less of it thanks to the rampant use of antibiotics for infections. But if you do get rheumatic chorea, the drug of choice would still be tetrabenazine initially. We don't use haloperidol any longer. And if you're not getting control with tetrabenazine, valproate is a good agent that can be used in a child with chorea. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vardia, uh, for thank your you very much. enlightening and a very interactive session. Thank uh, you, Dr. I Wadia. Uh, I request chairpersons to felicitate Dr. Wadia. <laughs> I request uh, Dr. Dhavle to please come on the stage and uh, felicitate uh, chairpersons. Uh, tea is served inside the hall, at the back of the hall. Dr. Dhavale is requested to felicitate Dr. Mute. Thank you, Dr. Dhavale, Dr. Dave, and Dr. Mute.